All right, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in once again to the Black Box Podcast. BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. Today we're still discussing the 2011 disappearance of Timothy Pitson that happened around the time of the suicide of his mother, Amy Fry Pitson. Even if you're just tuning in to this one here, part two, that's fine because most things on this channel are geared toward people who are more familiar with the case so we can talk about the theories as opposed to going by, through the piece by piece steps of background information. I also said in part one though that this is one that I am sort of just new to learning about. I, I heard about it years ago but I think that it's a very different take on the subject if you kind of get to hear what someone is doing step by step as they are kind of researching the case and learning about it as, you know, they make sort of each de new development and new discovery. And today we're really going to talk about kind of the motivations for Amy Fry Pitson to take Timothy Pitson on this very bizarre journey that they had leading up to his uh, disappearance and her death. Once again, she committed suicide by self-inflicted wounds, slitting her wrists, overdosing on antihistamines, getting in a bathtub, and when that was unsuccessful, she got out of the tub, picked up the knife again, and slit her throat. Okay, so, the thing is, though, we mentioned that there's a very bizarre route that they took with driving. Amy pulls Timothy out of school, they get into the car, they visit first a zoo, and then they um, take the real road trip, which is vis visiting a variety of locations in Illinois and Wisconsin, driving up to Wisconsin first and then driving south again. Okay, one of the things though that was um, I learned about recently was that a Amy had actually taken a recent vacation to the Bahamas two weeks prior to the um, disappearance and the road trip that she had done with Timothy. And a lot of people interpret that Amy's actions with Timothy prior to the disappearance and her suicide were having a last hurrah. And I can't really think of a better way to describe that because they're visiting re resorts and water parks and she's buying him toys. And a lot of people think that that's just like the last hurrah that she was going to have with her son before she would never see him again. And we know that she was planning that because she committed suicide and writing out a very detailed note about how Timothy would never be found and that he is safe but he'll never be found. Okay, but my first instinct kind of flared up when I was just like, okay, if she was visiting the Bahamas two weeks prior to this, maybe that was sort of her kind of last hurrah, something for herself, and then the trip to visiting the resorts and the water parks, the Kalahari Resort and all that, where Timothy was seen on the security footage, that was just something for Timothy. But I would have to insist that that would have to be twofold. Yes, okay, she wants to do these things for her son to... um visit places that he might like or buy him something that he might like but a bigger motivation for that is probably just it's something that she can say to keep him to go keep him you know for going along with the plan so if she were just driving to dingy motels in the middle of nowhere and just being like okay now we're just gonna sit here he would start to get restless he would start to panic he'd start freaking out and um it would draw attention to her and people would definitely know that something was wrong and then they would start to remember oh yeah yeah i did see those two people the boy was freaking out and he was terrified no she wants to keep him calm and keep him under control that is purely my first impression of when i would he heard some of these things and it's also the kind of water parks and the resorts and like you know visiting the zoo even these are things that she can do to create this kind of confusing route that people cannot calculate. In a future upload on the case, which hopefully we'll be covering very soon, sometime during the course of the uh, next week we can hopefully have perhaps a map of the the exact route that um, Amy Fry Pitson was driving, and we can probably try and narrow down some possible locations where Timothy may have been either exchanged or either given away to somebody or perhaps even murdered. I mean, as, gr as grim as it is to say that, the likelihood of Timothy being alive is rather low, but in this case, if there, there, there is a possibility for some things that we could say. 
we'll give some kind of possibilities about that in the future. But I think it would be very um, good to try and pinpoint an exact location when they would have parted ways. Because remember, in the motel where she committed suicide, she was the only person there. She only checked in by herself. She was only seen by herself. And there was absolutely no sign of Timothy in the motel where Amy Fry Pitson committed suicide. The other thing to say is that it's just like, you would really have to note that there is probably a lot of animosity in the marriage. I mean, she's contacting people. I mean, we mentioned that she contacted her mother, and I believe... The, oh, oh, now it's just escaped me. I was about to say, did she contact her brother-in-law? Was it her brother? I mean, she's contacted multiple people on the duration of this little road trip that she has done with Timothy. But she did not contact her husband, Jim. And that just really probably goes to show that two things exactly. She's dealing with depression, and she has a lot of animosity toward her husband. I mean, once again, if she wanted to commit suicide, she didn't have to take Timothy away. She could have committed suicide at home, or she could have committed suicide in the motel down the street. She didn't have to go through this very long, twisted route, and also ensuring that her son would never be seen again. So the thing is that um, it's very likely that she was probably harboring some deep resent for her husband and wanted him cut out of the picture, wanted him to suffer, or perhaps genuinely believed in her own disturbed state that being with Jim, Timothy being with Jim was a bad thing and she wanted to keep him away from her husband at all costs. But um, a lot of people do seem like they, even though her family says that Amy Fry Pitson would have never harmed Timothy you definitely get the feeling that she is dealing with some mental issues. And I was listening to the podcast, Thin Air, that had an interview with Jim Pitson, the father of Timothy. And he's just sort of saying, oh yeah, everything seemed normal, everything was fine. And I really liked how the interviewer would kind of weave in some questions about how um, he was like, wasn't there some incident where Amy Fry Pitson fell off a cliff or something like that? And like, or... um." You know, she had, like, some sort of incident with that, and she fell off as, like, a small overhang. And he's like, oh, yeah, she was feeling bad because she didn't get the job she wanted or she didn't get the salary she wanted, something like that. And so he's kind of, like, you know, he's kind of getting under the surface, you know, where to the point where he's like, okay, these, she probably did have some quite serious mental issues and either the family is kind of reluctant to talk about it or it was probably just so blended into normal life that it seemed rather normal at the time. How's everything going? Fine. You know, just, um, as it, I think that they kind of did a good way of, uh, bringing some of the emotional distress or the emotional issues rather that were going on with Amy Fry Pitson to the surface rather. And, um, they kind of brought that out and allowed us to kind of have a, um, a view at it and once again that was the thin air podcast so one of the things that i had listened to and there are other interviews with jim pitson and i mean he talks a lot about this they also print article interviews and um i um okay but uh let's look at another thing that is going on one of the things that i heard on the channel from danielle hallen was that timothy and his mother were driving a very specific route she stated that they learned that amy fry pitson had driven that route at least twice before, or at the very least, that she had mapped out the route. It was not arbitrary. She's not just driving in circles, and um, she's not just trying to be weird to do something confusing that people can't uh, predict. You know, she's not being unpredictable on purpose. She specifically chose the destinations that she was going to drive to. I mean, this was something that was very calculated. She had been on those roads at least twice, and it was very calculated. But the thing is, though, they have an enormous amount of forensic material from from uh, Amy's car. Like I was, um, it sounds like it's right out of forensic files. It's like they're going through the sediment samples that are on the tires that she had, so they know that she was driving in some rural area where Timothy was either murdered or given to another person, or perhaps even something else of that nature. Just abandoned i mean hopefully not that but in terms of you know just listing off possibilities there's something we could say about that but the thing is though um the area that they're talking about though is it's at least five counties they listed at least five counties although i think two of them are possible locations and like i said it'd be nice if we could kind of really examine some of that and devote a whole episode to looking at the map and uh maybe the possible places where Timothy and Amy Fry Pitson could have parted ways. But the thing is that I really would um, just like to say with that, we're still dealing with hundreds of miles. 
And that was a big instinctive thing that I said in part one, but I was just like, if she, you know, just either murdered him and buried his body or gave him to somebody, no, we have the exact route that they were driving. We're dealing with hundreds of miles, and you would be having to find, like, perhaps, you know, the area that is the size of an automobile. You know, we're just dealing with kind of like a even a four foot by five foot area of Illinois and Wisconsin. Very difficult to do. To pinpoint the exact place where he could potentially be buried. And even more difficult to find the place where he... What if, she, what if he was uh, given away to somebody? And some of the uh, alternative possibilities that uh, people have talked about are like... He could have been given to some place that, to given to a family that was living off the grid. He could have been taken into a religious order. He could have been pulled into someone who was just homeschooling him. And I think the last one out of those three was def would definitely be somewhat of the most plausible. I mean, that someone who was just kind of raising him at home under another identity. We mentioned one line from Daniel Howland about the uh, the route about how it was um about no about like the you know they got the um sediments from the uh, tires and such, but. She said something that I thought was interesting, and I don't know how other people would respond to it, where it's like, many people do not have vivid memories before the age of six. And she's not the first person to say that, but she brought it up. And she was wondering, like, is it possible that Timothy would just start to forget his family? Because somebody told me this about two years ago, that it's not normal to have vivid memories before the age of five. And, I mean, I've even talked to somebody once, and I was just shocked when she told me she didn't really remember anything before the age of seven. And she was just like, you know, just like she had no memories of, you know, even like what she was doing. And um, she just said she didn't have any real memories before the age of seven. And, like, you know, she's only like, uh, what, what was she, um, 18 at the time? Okay, so, I mean, this is not unheard of. I mean, I'll, I remember all kinds of things, even like, you know, going to kindergarten at age four age five and definitely you know the stuff prior to that at age four and perhaps even younger than that but um my family members as well all have vivid memories before the age of four so i mean that's kind of just something that we have that seems rather normal to us but she's kind of putting out the possibility that is he just going to kind of grow up and not remember that he was timothy pitson he's just taken on another identity and he's going to forget who he was I mean, that could definitely be possible, and we've explored a few other cases like that, something such as the disappearance of Garnell Moore, that could be a very big uh, theory and something like that, but I don't necessarily know how plausible that would be. They made that movie with Dev Patel called Lion that's based on a true story about the guy who was, um, guy from India who was separated from his family and then adopted and moved to Australia, but he could never forget the memories of his family back in India, and every person's going to be different. I will say, though, it seems it seems like it is neurologically po po possible to forget your life before the age of six, but um, I don't necessarily know if that's what we're dealing with here. And moreover, the likelihood of somebody, you know, doing something harmful to Timothy seems much greater in this particular case. I'd have to say, though, even with Amy Fry Pitson's kind of emotional state, it's like, it's highly um, improbable that she probably would have sold him into any trade or something like that. We're talking about human trafficking of sorts. I mean, I just, I can't even fathom that. She certainly, because she's writing in the suicide note that he is safe. And once again, we mentioned that people could interpret that, that, you know, he's with God or he's with the angels or something like that. But the thing is that we don't really have any physical evidence to say that he was sold into human trafficking or abducted. And this is the heart and soul of the theories all associated. Was he in, is he in homeschool somewhere? Is he living off the grid? Is he part of a religious order? No physical evidence to support that. If they had some sort of email that they found on her computer that said she was messaging with a convent in Canada or something like that, I mean, that would be a lead. That would be an issue where they could use that and try to track down this said order in Canada. But we don't have that type of physical evidence. Otherwise, this case would probably have been solved a long time ago. So that's really leading me to still go with the first possible notion that Timothy Pitson was indeed murdered. One of the things, though, that um, 
Amy Fry Pitson overdosed herself intentionally on antihistamines, and I believe there was children's cough syrup present, and children's cough syrup can be used in fatal overdoses. I mean, that's not unheard of either, so that could have been one of the ways that uh, Timothy Pitson passed away, but there could be countless things. I don't even know if it's relevant for us to discuss a possible cause of death, because we don't know if Timothy is dead or alive, and I don't think it's that important to know how Amy Fry Pitson would have murdered him. If indeed she did murder him, it would just be like, that wouldn't really change the subject. I would say that the much more pressing issue would be, where is Timothy buried? And how can people kind of bring closure to the subject? And that's why I said we could look at the map and try to figure out the exact location about where they could have possibly parted ways. I have no certainty of saying that Timothy was murdered. So, in terms of logic, if we're just going to kind of examine this, I mean, is it possible to say that it's more logical to believe that he is still alive? In, in high-profile missing persons cases, the answer is usually that the person has passed away very shortly after their disappearance. But what I said in part one was, if there's any case that has you know, the chance that he is still alive, it's probably this one. And I do cite that suicide note as, as evidence. Also, just the fact, like, this would have to be something that is kind of very calculated, but it does seem a little bit bizarre that she would commit suicide in a bathtub by herself. 